I know with all of the things that Donald Trump says and does on a daily basis, it could be overwhelming. But here at the Midas Touch Network, I don't want you to forget that this is his view of the Department of Justice and what he would do with our legal system. Play this clip. Yeah, but if you become president and you don't like somebody or if somebody's beating you by 10, 15 or 20 points like we're doing with crooked Joe Biden, let's indict the motherfucker. Let's indict him. I'm here with two of the most powerful legal voices in the pro-democracy community, Mike Mike Sachs and Ellie Mistal. It's going to be a continuing series here. I want to talk about what Trump would do with the DOJ, what Vice President Kamala Harris would be with the DOJ. And I'm just so honored to have you both together on this network. Uh, Mike, let me toss it to you. Yeah, Ben, thanks for having us. And I just want to say for years now, Ellie and I have been talking about all this stuff, Justice Department stuff, Supreme Court stuff, lower court stuff together, and how thrilled I am that the country is now paying attention to all of these things as a matter of politics and democracy, not least because you, Ellie, have made it so. So I'm Mike Sachs. I'm a senior advisor with Court Accountability. I do law and politics here with Midas Touch. Ellie, I shouldn't say you need an introduction because you don't, but introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Ellie Mastal. I'm the Justice Correspondent for the Nation. And me and Mike right now, we're doing like the text chats have become the entire video. Um, so I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, so Ellie, let's just get it started, right? Um, ben had mentioned we're talking about the Justice Department. We also, you and me, are always focused on the Supreme Court. We're always focused on what's going to happen with these main policy making and breaking justices, politicians, really, uh, in our country. You know, we can talk as much as we want about the White House, about Congress, but all roads, as you know, lead to the Supreme Court. And if Trump wins, they'll probably he'll probably get a couple of vacancies. I'm guessing Thomas. I'm guessing Alito. I've got some views on whether or not Thomas will go. But I want to ask you, Trump justices, who do you think is going to be there? Yeah, so the important thing for people to understand is that this is really one of the starkest contrasts between a Trump presidency and a Harris presidency. If Trump is reinstalled as president, he will get to nominate a number of new Supreme Court justices. And whether or not it comes from a retirement from Thomas or a retirement from Leto or an untimely passing from Sotomayor, um, he will once again reshape the nature of the Supreme Court. Now, personally, based on my reporting, I believe it is most likely that if Thomas or Alito retires, the next man up is a man named James Ho, currently a justice on the Fifth Circuit. Court of Appeals, one of the most radical and rabid conservatives in the country. It is James Ho, um, uh, listeners might remember, who who decided that people had the right to sue um, the makers of Mifepristone, the abortion pill uh, drug, based on a standing argument um, that involved equating women to like natural wildlife that people have a interest in protecting. He basically said that women were like manatees, and that is why you could ban Mifepristone. I think he's going to be first out of the gate should Alito retire, because Alito, quite frankly, hates his job, and Alito's wife, quite frankly, hates his job. Um, Like Mike, I kind of think that Thomas is leaving in a coffin um, more than anything else. Thomas loves the power and the RVs that come with being a Supreme Court justice. But if either of one of those two guys retire, James Ho is first out of the gate, right? Yeah, Second, now, Ellie, Ellie, before but, we go on to, to next, I want to dig in a bit more about Ho himself. You had mentioned the bit about his finding standing for the Mipipristone plaintiffs, the doctors that were pretty much astroturfed into Amarillo, Texas to get before a judge there who we might talk about in a moment. Uh, but that standing argument was was very much a reversal of how we've seen conservative courts act and be uh, as conservative over the past 40 years. They were all about keeping people out of court. And the idea that Ho brought in, imported really, a argument that was given by the most liberal justice ever in the 70s, 60s and 70s for trees to have standing to sue uh, so that he could find standing for these doctors that the Supreme Court unanimously ultimately held did not have an ability to get into the courtroom. Uh, It speaks a lot about where the right-wing legal movement is right now and what Ho represents in that right-wing legal movement, which perhaps might be even more to the right than his former boss and mentor, Clarence Thomas. And not to mention also 
that he, where was he sworn in? Where was Hoe sworn in? He was sworn in by Thomas with his predecessor as the Solicitor General of Texas, Ted Cruz, standing by in Harlan Crow's room, a big grand room with a giant uh, fireplace behind them. So can you talk a little bit about those, not just optics, but actualities there? Yeah, so Ho is not best understood of as a judge. He is best understood of as a conservative culture warrior who happens to wear a robe, all right? Like that's that's how you have to conceive of this, this man. He is... He, he he brings Samuel Alito's level of uh, spikiness and pissed offness towards the media. He's constantly railing about how conservatives need to have better media representation. He is the leader in trying to – of the cancel culture on the conservative right where he tries to cancel um, law students who speak out, who protest, um, um, who do anything other than conform – um, to the nor norms, Ho always is trying to get those law students fired or to keep those law students from having a job. And let's also let's never forget that you know one of his main uh, uh, agenda items is to make the world safe for mass shooters and domestic abusers who want to have his gun. Some of his most risable opinions involve his thoughts on how domestic abusers cannot be relieved of their firearms that they use to threaten their domestic partners um, because of the Second Amendment. So Ho is out there in terms of his kind of right-wing agenda, but he's also, I, I think we have to understand this, what the conservatives have normalized as a Supreme Court judge. So I think that he is a, a very dangerous uh, candidate. And the, the last thing I'll point out, especially as a replacement to Thomas, the conservatives, see, the way that conservatives do affirmative action and DEI is that they love to get minority voices who speak towards white supremacist views. That is the Clarence Thomas story over the past 30 years. Ho, if Trump nominates him, uh, if Trump wins and nominates him, would be the first Asian American justice on the Supreme Court. And they will try to make hay out of that. They will try to say like, oh, look, we are so we are the inclusive party because we have nominated the first Asian American, even though Ho's views are kind of standard boilerplate uh, white supremacist views when it comes to legal representation. So Ho is a very dangerous character, um, and, and he is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the kind of judges that Trump will appoint. Right, but, Ellie, I should note that Ho isn't alone among those with his extreme views on the Fifth Circuit, and that the circuit has proven itself almost too extreme for what already is an extreme Supreme Court based on opinions that Ho himself has issued uh, either in concurrence or majority. But he, although Ho is not alone, and there's other colleagues of his in the Fifth Circuit, Trump will also, if, if he, as you mentioned, is installed uh, as president, uh, whether through the Electoral College or other shenanigans that didn't work out in 2020 and could actually go to the Supreme Court for some help as well. If Trump does become president again, he'll be looking for someone who's displayed a certain level of fealty, loyalty to him. And I, I think there's someone in mind that I think everyone who's watched Midas Touch is quite aware of. Yeah, I, I think that the second justice out of the gate, especially if, God forbid, Trump is elected and Sonia Sotomayor passes away, um, is most likely Eileen Cannon. Eileen Cannon, the current district court judge in Florida who has been so helpful to Trump um, in his espionage case, um, what she has expressed that Trump will like is loyalty, right? Um, people forget Trump despite nominating three Supreme Court justices, lost 59 of his 60 um, electoral challenges after the 2020 election. Um, certainly, if he gets back into power, he will be looking for Supreme Court justices that are kind of explicitly loyal to him. And Eileen Cannon, I mean, she couldn't be more loyal if she spent all of her time licking his boots. All right. So like that, that's who's likely next. But Mike, let me turn it around on you. That's that's the dark side. That, that, that's what's happening um, um, if Trump wins. What if he loses? What if Kamala Harris wins? Again, Thomas might retire. Thomas uh, Alito might retire. They're both older. Sonia Sotomayor might retire under a Harris administration. Who do you think are, are the justices um, that uh, Vice President Harris is looking at? Yeah, if we're looking at Justin Sotomayor being the first to step down, being the most senior of the liberals and Obama's first appointment, I can only look towards one other person. Her name is Myrna Perez. She's a Second Circuit Justice, and she was a voting rights lawyer before joining the Second Circuit. And that's a big deal, because right now, the Supreme Court and its moderate center-left Democratic-appointed justices 
have been waging a war for democracy from the court, dissenting with every anti-democratic ruling the court has made to dilute, suppress, not yet perhaps, but perhaps soon subvert votes, uh, saying this can't, this can't be. The Constitution does not demand these things. And Perez cut her teeth as a lawyer and an advocate to ensure robust voting rights for minorities, for students, for elderly, for anyone who the right has targeted for voter suppression, Perez has been on the side to ensure they have a voice in our democracy. So now she's at the Second Circuit. That's also Sotomayor's old stomping grounds. And when we have our first Latina justice to leave the bench, I doubt that Harris is going to be interested in having zero Latina justices on the bench. So for me, Myrna Perez is the is the uh, is the no thought, totally um, expected answer to a Sotomayor uh, uh, retirement. Mike, That's I love the pick, but I feel like you misspelled Elizabeth Prelogger. Like, I don't, <laughs> how, how do we get what? What about what about the lady of the moment? What about the current U.S. Solicitor General, Liz Prelogger? Do you think she has a shot of being on the Supreme Court? So I do. I think that in an ideal world in which there were no other considerations at play for representation and diversity on the bench, then she would be the natural replacement, especially for Kagan. Prelogger is now the SG. Kagan came straight from the SG's office to go to the Supreme Court. Neither of them had judicial experience beforehand. And Prelogger is probably the best Solicitor General, really perhaps ever, to take the podium. And this is something that's shared across the way. The, the right-wing justices on the court love playing with her. Justice, Chief Justice Roberts is always testing her in ways that sound antagonistic, but it's a game recognizing game situation because he was known as the best advocate for the Supreme Court before he was put on the bench himself. But Kagan is the lone Jewish justice. She's the only one. There were as many as three when Breyer and Ginsburg were also on the court. And I don't think Harris will be interested in having zero Jewish justices on the bench uh, should Kagan retire under her. And there's one Jewish judge on the court who I think would be uh, as a matter of demographics, then as a matter of politics and partisan trolling, frankly, uh, would be an ideal pick for a Harris administration. And that would be uh, Judge Julie Reichelman of the First Circuit. She argued uh, against Mississippi in the Dobbs case. She was a reproductive rights lawyer for her entire career. So if she were put on put on the bench beside the five justices, if not to vote to overturn Roe and the six to vote to gut Roe and Casey uh, and sit next to sit beside a few seats down from Alito, that would be seen as a very trollish thing. And also she comes from a Ukrainian background, which, as we know, in the current Republican politics, uh, isn't a very popular thing. So if Harris wanted to be a full troll, but also put forward someone who's eminently qualified and represents the type of demographics and ideological interests that the Democratic Party is into, then he, she couldn't go wrong with Reichelman. Mazel, my friend, mazel. That, 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 <laughs> there, there are, that, that is a compelling argument to me. All right, Ellie, let's move on. Before, I, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you for a sec, because Ben introduced us saying we're going to talk about the AGs. And everyone watching here is like, what about the attorneys general? Well, we big footed and started talking about the Supreme Court first, because of course we're SCOTUS heads, but also we know that's the most important thing in the country right now. But attorneys general is also a big deal as you've been covering with Garland himself, uh, as doing whatever he was doing or dithering on bringing the, the Trump charges against him. Uh, I wanna ask you, because you just have a piece that came out in the nation where you are a column, where you are a, a, a um, columnist and a, a correspondent there, the justice correspondent there. What, who do you think, VP Harris, should she become president, would pick for her attorney general? Not Merrick Garland. Anybody <laughs> but Merrick Garland. I, I mean, you you could you could pick me. You could pick you. Anybody but Merrick Garland is my like starting is is the start is the ceiling is the floor on this issue, right? If you understand what the problem Merrick Garland is, then though the the important thing to get is that Garland had a judicial temperament to a prosecutorial office. Moreover, his main ambition was to restore integrity to the Justice Department, which is nice and understandable, especially after, you know, Bill Barr and the toilet bowl salesman, Matt Whitaker and Jeff's like, I get why that's important. But by the same token, like if I woke up in the morning and said, my goal, my ambition is to stay off the crack pipe. All right. That that's a thing. That's a that's an important thing. But you might want to have a higher ambition with your life's work than staying off the pipe in the <laughs> same way. I think we need a 
higher ambition for the Department of Justice than merely restoring integrity. And based on my reporting, Harris has a number of candidates, a number of options that she's thinking about um, who would do more than restore integrity um, to the Department of Justice. The first name out of the box, quite frankly, from what I've been hearing, is a woman named Andrea Campbell. She is currently the Attorney General of the state of Massachusetts. Um, Campbell has an agenda, and that agenda tracks closely with something that we used to talk about a lot in 2020, which is the scourge of police brutality in this country and the need to hold local police officers accountable, right? Um, uh, as Massachusetts Attorney General, um, Campbell has started an entire unit based around police accountability. She's come out against qualified immunity. She's come out for a bunch of uh, strategies and programs that respect the police, honor the police, give the police the tools to do the work that we need them to do but to also hold them accountable when they make mistakes and certainly when they commit crimes. Um, and, and so Campbell is, is a hot name um, in Harris circles as a potential AG pick. Um, another hot name and, and, uh, for my reporting, I know she wants the job, is the current New York Attorney General, Letitia James. James did something that Merrick Garland could not do, which is get a conviction of Donald Trump from financial crimes. Certainly a Department of Justice that was more focused on white collar crimes would be a welcome thing in this country. And so uh, Tish James is also a strong candidate. Mike. So yeah, that's... Ellie, I, I saw something also in the New Republic today, a, uh, a piece saying, what about Jamie Raskin? I, 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 li I like Congressman Raskin um, quite a lot. I have not been bumped. Jamie Raskin is the person that has bumped me from television programs more than anybody else, right? So apparently, if you can't get Jamie Raskin, call me up. I'm like the homeless man's Jamie Raskin <laughs> if you're doing a TV show. Um, so I, look, I love Congressman Raskin. Um, he is great, but he's also a great congressman. And I think especially in a world where Democrats retake the House, you can imagine him having more power mm. um, in the House to do the things that we need to do. And the Democrats have such a deep bench that you kind of don't have to pluck somebody from a critically important job to put them in to a critically important job because there are actually quite a few uh, uh, candidates and potentials across the Democratic Party, Democratic Party um, with a lot of uh, experience and, and could bring a lot to the table. But Mike, before we close, I want to turn it around on you. That's that's if Harris wins, right? That's in a that's a Department of Justice committed to the rule of law and equity and justice for all people. Um, that happens if, if Harris wins. What happens if she loses? What kinds of people is Donald Trump thinking of to nominate for attorney general after his, let's say, um, unhappiness with his previous attorney general picks of Jeff Sessions and Bill Barr? Loyalists and election deniers. And two right off the top of my head are in my mind. Jeff Clark who was just uh, kind of a random DOJ official that in the tumult leading up to January 6th, found his way to almost leading the department and pushing the election denying legal arguments to Trump and out into the world to sympathetic outside counsel, such as Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, who then ran with the proposal to try to go straight to the Supreme Court to overturn the election in a suit against the states that voted for Joe Biden to overturn those uh, those election results. So those two, Jeff Clark and Ken Paxton, the former uh, having been disgraced as a DOJ official and also now just stripped out of the indictment uh, from from um, from uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Special Counsel Smith. Jack Smith, um, he had to strip jo the Jeff Clark shenanigans out of his indictment against Trump for election interference because of the Supreme Court's immunity uh, decision said that the stuff that Jeff Clark did was, was official acts with Trump, so Trump would have been immune, which we all know was made up and stupid. Um, but oh. Clark would be one of the first picks, and then, yeah, then Ken Paxton, who's been uh, charged with corruption uh, in Texas, survived to, to an extent those, uh, those um, those allegations and is now leading raids on uh, Latino voting rights advocates who might also be octogenarians in their own homes. So these are the types of people that I think would be tapped to pick 
uh, as, as, as Trump's AGs, people who do not like democracy and want to perpetuate Republican power despite the will of the people. I'll throw one more name into the mix just because he messes with me on Twitter with racially tinged biased crap. Mike Davis, he's a former Neil Gorsuch clerk, um, a former aide to Senator Chuck Grassley um, when Grassley was in charge of the Judiciary Committee. And again, this is a man that I know of through Twitter because he likes to make racially tinged comments at me. So my last thing here to, to, to you all today is Please don't elect Donald Trump, because if you do, I probably need to move out of the country and out of the long arm reach of his Department of Justice, because I will be in trouble if any of those uh, crazy white folks get in charge of the DOJ. And Ellie, I look forward to the flames you're going to get upon saying that on this here inaugural discussion between you and me here on the Midas Touch Network. Uh, Ellie, you are the justice correspondent at The Nation. I am a senior advisor with an organization called Court Accountability. We'll be back at you with more in the coming days and weeks. We, we're excited to talk all about all things democracy and this country with you on the Midas Touch Network. Love this video? Make sure you stay up to date on the latest breaking news and all things Midas by signing up to the Midas Touch newsletter at MidasTouch.com newsletter.